Welcome, every. Whoops, is this one on? <laughs> Welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Weil Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all, welcome all of you here today on behalf of both the Ford School and our new Center for Public Policy in Diverse Societies. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our speaker, Professor Ibonia Washington. Um, Ibonia is the Henry Cohn Associate Professor of Economics at Yale University. She received her PhD in economics from MIT in 2003 with specializations in public finance and political economy and research interests in the interplay of race, gender, and political representation, the behavioral motivations and consequences of political participation, and the processes through which low-income Americans meet their financial needs. And as you know, her talk this afternoon will focus on very important and timely issues related to food purchasing and the design of social safety nets. Abonya's research is highly interdisciplinary, and in fact, while in Ann Arbor this week, she will be meeting with faculty and students from the Economics Department and the Department of Political Science, in addition to those of us here at the Ford School, and we're very grateful to her for her time. Today's event is the first in a series of distinguished lectures to be hosted by the Diversity Center this year, and I'd like to take just a moment to say a word or two about the Center. We opened our doors last year as a first-of-its-kind initiative designed to shed light on how public policy can most effectively navigate opportunities as well as challenges that arise as our societies become increasingly diverse locally, nationally, and globally. We have a number of additional public events that are planned for the fall, and you can learn more about them on our website, along with information about our research and educational programming uh, and various activities that the center has funded over the past year. And with that, it is a great pleasure to welcome Ivonia Washington to the podium. Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I need to say, first off, research is generally, of course, a very solitary profession, but uh, this, this research, piece of research that I'll speak to you about today is joint work with my colleague, Justine Hastings. Now, we already have a pretty long title up there, first of the month, Grocers, Shoppers, and Purchasing Power, but actually, I'm going to make it even a little bit longer by saying grocers, low-income shoppers, and purchasing power. Right? To be clear that we're, we're talking about uh, low-income shoppers, in particular people who qualify for government benefits, food stamps, and, and cash welfare. Okay, so I know that you've had a talk recently, about a year ago maybe, about uh, low-income neighborhoods that do not have access to grocery stores. Okay? So we're talking about now, low-income neighborhood that, that, no, low neighborhoods that do have access to grocery stores, but still trying to understand um, what the purchasing patterns of the people at, at these grocery stores look like, how the store pricing is at, at these grocery stores, um, to think about policies where we could even continue to improve people's welfare. I mean, clearly getting a grocery store is a big step, but then there's, there's still other policy um, uh, initiatives to be taken. Okay, so, so in particular, the questions that I will address today, what do benefit recipients buy at the grocery store? Okay. Uh, you know, this is very interesting because one of the criticisms of, of low-income people in particular is that, well, they're not buying food that's as nutritious as, as middle-income or, or higher-income people are. And then one, uh, one response to that is, well, that's because of what's available in the neighborhoods. So now we can take a look at a neighborhood that does have a huge grocery store and, and ask this question, uh, what do buy benefit recipients buy when they do have a grocery store? Uh, secondly, we'll look at when benefit recipients buy at the grocery store. Okay, exactly. When are they in the store uh, buying the things that they buy? And finally, how does the store's pricing respond to their patterns of shopping? Okay? And for all these questions, we'll want to look at the implications for both health and economic policy. So let me be very clear about the context that we're talking about. Unfortunately, I don't have, uh, I don't have local data. I have great data that I'm very excited about. 
in that I have access to the scanner data from a large uh, grocery store chain that you know, operates nationally. And so we have uh, two years' worth of scanner data from three stores in Nevada. Okay. Three different stores uh, with different share in, in neighborhoods that are uh, all low-income neighborhoods, but you can see more and less disadvantaged. Okay. So store one, uh, about 14% of the purchases made at that store are purchases by households that receive government benefits. In store two, that figure is 26%. And store three, you can see this is from the most impoverished neighborhood, 45%. Okay? And again, just to understand the context, we're talking about poor urban neighborhoods, uh, heavily Latino neighborhoods. Uh, and so to give you some, some demographics, you know, high school graduation rates pretty low in these neighborhoods. Okay. And some background on the, the benefits that I, I keep saying benefit recipients, so let me be specific about the benefits that I'm talking about. First off, food stamps, right? So I imagine many of you are familiar. It's a federal means-tested program uh, that provides a currency that can only be used to purchase food for home preparation. <laughs> So to make that concrete, you go to your local store, uh, your local grocery store, and perhaps there's a deli counter. I imagine there is. I passed a huge Whole Foods as I came in here, so it <laughs> looked like you would have a lot of stuff in there. So uh, you, you go to the deli, the deli counter uh, and you ask for a prepared sandwich. That could not be paid for with, with food stamps, right? But if you uh, walked through the aisles and grabbed your own bread, mayonnaise, tomatoes, ham, then that could be paid for uh, with food stamps just so we understand the difference. And I'm saying food stamps, and I think people still do say food stamps, but obviously that's a bit of archaic languages because, because uh, no one's walking around with stamps anymore. Everyone has electronic cards, right? Okay, and secondly, cash welfare, and again, we've had big changes in, in terminology in this in the, in the last uh, 10 years or so. And so, of course, the program used to be called AFDC nationally, and now it's administered state by state, and so there's going to be a different name state by state, but I think folks understand what I'm talking about, I'm talking about means-tested programs that provide cash to low-income families, primarily low-income families with children. Okay? And, and as is the case in, in Nevada, like in many, in probably all states in the United States, now all of these benefits are delivered on electronic cards that look just like a debit card. Okay? Uh, in Nevada, the benefits are delivered electronically for both of these programs on the first of the month. Okay? And basically, these benefits do not expire. If you don't use your card for something like nine months, then you might have trouble using it. But I want you to understand that you don't have to rush on the last day of the month to use up uh, what you are getting. So the data that I'm excited about come from uh, the skin of the grocery store machine, of the, of the grocery store, of the, the, the checkout. So it's the data that are, that are collected, basically, when you make your purchase. So say you're buying an apple. We would know that you bought, it, you bought one apple. Uh, we would know the weight of the apple, the price per weight, and therefore can compute from there your, your total price, how you paid. Okay, so maybe you paid with cash, maybe you paid with a credit card, maybe you paid with one of these benefit cards, right? Um, and coupled with your loyalty ID card, so you know now many of these grocery stores have, if you want to get any discounts, you have to swipe your loyalty card. Uh, so we, we observe you, you know, we know who you are every time you come in because you're swiping that loyalty card. And so then we can identify benefit recipients as those folks who ever pay throughout the month with their benefit card, okay? Is that clear? Great, then let's get into the meat of things. What do benefit recipients buy? And again, this is interesting because uh, we note that there are difference between what low-income people eat and what people with, with higher income eat, but part of that we understand to be because of a lack of, of, of access. So what happens when we have, when, when there is uh, the access, when it's on, when you have these grocery stores on, you know, well-traveled bus lines and, and, and people can get to these stores? All right, 
So let's look at that. So across our three stores, uh, benefit recipients purchase 29% of the products, okay? Or make 29% of the purchases in dollars, right? And so that's that orange line across is there at that 29%, okay? And then I'm, I've just taken, um, I've just highlighted for you a few different goods. Uh, and so you can see that if the bar, for instance, is below the 29%, then the benefit recipients are purchasing less than their fair share, if you will. And if it's higher, then they're purchasing more. All right? So let's look at the, the different goods. So the first two I have here are alcohol and tobacco. Right? And so I think it's, it's important to point out that in, in terms, at least in terms of what purchasing the store, uh, benefit recipients are much less likely to purchase alcohol, right? than the non-benefit recipients, okay, relative to their size. And tobacco, it's about even, okay? They're purchasing about the amount um, that they represent in the store. Yes? Quick question. Uh, after they can't use their benefit debit card. Absolutely not. Okay. So you can, you can uh, mesh what they buy with their benefit card with what they purchase with their own Yes, I can. Okay. Right. I can, and I, I recognize them even if they come in one time and do not use their benefits at all, right? At the end of the month, perhaps they have no benefits left, but because of that loyalty card that they needed to swipe for the discounts, I know it's the same family, okay? And what's nice, again, I said for the scanner data, you, get, you, you can see things very much in detail, and so what would happen if I want to come in and I want to buy the meat to make a deli sandwich, make a sandwich for my children, but I also want to buy a pack of cigarettes? In my data, I would see very clearly that I paid for the one with food stamps, and I paid for the other with cash or a credit card. What's yeah. your purchases from people with I'm sorry, I did not hear you. Uh, what percent of purchases come from people with loyalty cards? Uh, so, so you've actually identified the data. Um, there have been told there are two groups of the beneficiaries of the loyalty cards that have been found. Right. Um, and behavior between them, I think. Right. Um, Right, so obviously we're only talking here about people who have uh, the, the loyalty cards, and so what we do is we take out the, uh, the, I mean, everyone is swiped with a loyalty card, of course, but perhaps they're using the cashier's loyalty card or something like that, right? So we take out those purchases, um, which seem to all, you know, all be done by the same one, yeah. Um, did you, is it okay for them? Did, okay, yeah. Right, so that we can't add up for the non-benefit recipients, right? We don't know what the total is, is supposed to be, but we do have a sense that the benefit recipients are purchasing, are, are spending a large share at the grocery store. And in fact, we do all of our analyses limiting to folks that we actually see in the beginning and at the end of the month and get similar, uh, similar results. Yeah. Yes. line and I just mean to mark the fact that benefit recipients make 29% of purchases overall, right? And so if they made, if benefit recipients and non-benefit recipients uh, purchased everything equally, then all those black bars would, would hit that orange line, right? To the extent that they're under, that means that benefit recipients are purchasing less relative to non-benefit recipients and to the extent that they're over, benefit recipients are purchasing more of that good relative to non-benefit recipients. Is that clear? Great. Okay, so I think we have an idea of how, how the, uh, to work the graph. So then I just picked out some other categories to give us a sense. All right, so this is candy, and it's a little bit above. Okay. Uh, 
uh, benefit recipients purchasing a little bit more, as is true for meat and salty snacks. Okay, so benefit recipients purchasing a little bit more of these things than non-benefit recipients relative to their share. But then the last three bars, I want to hone in on the goods that people are really, really concerned with, or that people talk about uh, when they talk about this issue, and that's fresh produce. Okay, fresh produce is this one right here, and you, so what we can see is right. The, there's the, the yeah, people say, well, low-income people don't don't eat enough fresh fruit, don't eat enough fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, but that's because there aren't fresh fruits and vegetables in the low-income neighborhoods. And so you can see here, even in the store that has fresh produce, right, you see the benefit recipients purchasing less than their fair share, if you will. Right? <coughs> but you can say, ask, well, to what extent is that made up by frozen? Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that it's just as healthy, but it's, you know, we're still eating fruits and vegetables. All right, so here's frozen fruit. Not at all, right, much less than the fair share. And there's frozen vegetables, okay. The frozen vegetables are, in a sense, compensating for the lack of, of, the, um, of the fresh vegetables. Okay. So any questions about this? Just trying to look just purely descriptive at the purchasing patterns. Yes? I'm thinking more about the benchmarking. These, um, all the people that would go to these stores would tend to live in a low-income neighborhood. So we're basically looking at low-income people that have Benefits versus low-income people who do not. Exactly. Or are not using them for. Well, there it actually is some income variation in ours, but you, but but the point is well taken that you might want to see this graph with just quarter one, quarter one of quartile one of income versus quartile four, if we think that's the correct correct benchmark. The people who are not on benefits, though, overall do actually have more money uh, than right. than, than the course, folks here. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, some people qualify for benefits and don't take them, so there, there's that as well. Okay. <coughs> Oops. Okay, so uh, what do benefit recipients buy? Well, even with the access to the grocery store, uh, we see that there are differences in the purchasing patterns. Benefit recipients are purchasing fewer fresh fruits and vegetables, at least, if we just stick to talking about fresh, right? And, and so the policy implication here is there might be a greater role for things like, like double food stamps, right? So in neighborhoods where there is no grocery store at all, and if we, and, 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 and the government wants to encourage low-income folks to eat uh, fruits and vegetables, like uh, very near to where I live, and then you, there are farmer's markets, right, uh, that, that provide the fresh fruits and vegetables, and then the government will often say, you know, you can use your food stamps at these farmers markets, that's one step, or even more, you get two for one at the farmers markets with your food stamps, okay, right, so you use a dollar worth of food stamps, you get two dollars worth of fruits and vegetables, and the idea is to incentivize people to buy these fresh fruits and vegetables, and we need this incentive because folks have to make two trips in this, right, <laughs> they have to go to this farmers, farmers market um, to get the fruits and vegetables. But this suggests there might be a role for these things even in neighborhoods in which there are a grocery store, a role for some kind of incentive program, even in areas where there are, uh, are actually grocery stores. And in fact, states like California were thinking of doing pilot programs to that effect. Uh, but these ideas came about <coughs> largely as the recession was coming about, so I, I haven't seen one that went all the way through and, and really provided some nice data, but, but maybe people will, will go back to that idea. There was a question you, back you here. Answered my question. Oh, wow, okay, great. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's move on and, and think about when are benefit recipients buying their food and when are they in the store? Okay. So right here I'm showing you actually, in that last slide, Remember, I picked out, say, five or six categories. Here, I'm showing you half the categories in the store. And for each category, I have two bars, okay? So the red, first red blue is alcoholic beverages. The second red blue is candy, gum, and mints, okay? So for each, each category, I'm showing you two bars. The first bar is the fraction of purchases that benefit recipients do 
of that product in the first two weeks of the month. Okay, remember they get the money on the first day of the month. And the second bar is the purchases in the second two weeks. Okay? So I'm showing you half the categories in the store. And what I hope you notice immediately is the red bar is always higher than the blue bar to its right. Okay, so it's red bar, red, red, blue, red, blue pairing, so it, it always starts with the red. The red is always higher than the blue to its right. In some cases, there's a big difference. In some cases, like alcohol, the first one, there's a very small difference, but there's always a larger share of the purchases being done by benefit recipients in the first half of the month. And I'll show you the, the second half of the graph. Um, the pattern continues. Okay? So the answer to the question of when are benefit recipients purchasing, okay, is that they're purchasing more in the beginning of the month, more when they first receive their benefits. And here is a graph we can think about uh, looking week by week. So each of those bars is a week. The darker bars, the darkest bar is week one, week two, week three, week four. And if we think about what you purchase in week one as being, you know, 100%, your, your full, what you would purchase, you know, uh, in full, okay, then we can look and see in week two, relative to, to week one, you're purchasing about 80% of what you were purchasing in week one, okay, and in week three, that falls to about 74%, and week four uh, to 70%, right? So they're purchasing less as the month goes on. Okay? Now that's the, not the same pattern as non-benefit recipients. Okay, here are the non-benefit recipients here. You see there's hardly any difference between week one, week two, week three, week four. Okay? So, okay, fine, but why is that at all interesting? I could go to the store and I could buy uh, all my food in the, in the beginning of the month and I could buy things like sardines and and crackers and things that I could eat all the way through the month and so who cares that I did all my shopping at the beginning maybe I like going to Costco you know that's fine um, so let's look at this by exactly that difference goods that you can store and that if you bought in week one would still be edible for you to eat in week four versus things that are perishable like milk and other dairy products and meat that if you bought in the first day of the month, you wouldn't want to be eating in the last day of the month, right? So these first four bars are what you saw before for benefit recipients, just for comparison. And then here are the storable goods. Yeah, we see that same kind of drop, but we don't care because you could buy that at the beginning of the month and you could still be eating it at the end of the month. We would, we're not concerned, okay? But we also see that pattern in the perishables. Right? We also see that pattern in the perishables. You're buying fewer of, thing, of things like milk and cheese uh, toward the end of the month. Right? So we know that you're eating less of those things. And so this corroborates evidence that we've gotten from diary studies, where you go to people's houses and you actually ask them to write down everything that they've eaten, that uh, people on, on benefits are buying and eating, right? if we look at their food diaries, less at the end of the month than they are at the beginning of the month. Yes? I'm just curious, how is it possible that both storable and perishables drop by less from the first to the fourth than all? Is there another category that's included in all that's not? There's, there's two other. Oh, yeah, right. we did okay. treats and, um, and also think, taking alcohol and tobacco separately. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, and in fact, I'll show you, it's not the alcohol and tobacco. There's the alcohol and tobacco one, right? There's not a lot of change. I mean, it's a, it, they're addictive things. We wouldn't necessarily expect that. I'm just, just, just trying to show you. Okay? Question? No. Okay. So then it's interesting to ask, okay, we know that they're eating less at the end of the month, buying and eating less at the end of the month. Uh, we know this from, we can see this in our grocery store data, which corroborates things that we have seen in, in people's food diaries, right? Which gives us more confidence that they're shopping at the same places in the beginning at the end of the month because the stuff is matching what we see in food diaries, okay? Um, 
But another question we could ask is, does what benefit recipients buy change throughout the month? Right? If, you, if you know you're not quite going to make it buying the same thing to the end of the month, are you substituting away? Are you eating, I'm going to exaggerate here, you know, steak at the beginning of the month and spam at the end of the month? Okay? Is that what's going on? Okay? And in fact, we don't see that here. Right? So this is the overall results that you saw before. Okay, I'm calling that quantity now because we're just talking about the quantity of food. And then on the last two columns, the last two sets of four bars, I'm talking about the quality of the food. Okay? And we have several measures in the paper, but here I've pulled out two quality indices. Okay? One is just using the grocery store's labeling. Okay? There are certain products that are labeled premium. Right? And so we can see if the share of, of premium products changes throughout the month. Okay? <coughs> and we find that that's not the case. Okay? We don't see that substitution to less quality, to lower quality goods. And the second set of four bars, the second quality index I'm showing you here, uh, is looking at what are the folks, the highest income folks, what are they purchasing? Okay? Uh, and how, well, how much do, or what the benefit recipients look like, look, uh, does it look like what the um, high income people are, are buying? And the extent to which it does, it doesn't all that much, but the extent to which it does, does not change, okay, uh, throughout the month. Okay, yeah. What classifies high income, or is that just those who are non benefit recipients? Oh, yes. Okay, so the question was, what, what classifies them as high income to put them into this graph? So, probably your grocery store does this too. Uh, they collect information on you, okay? Maybe for the loyalty card, you need to fill out some information about your address and so forth and so on. And so what the grocery store will do is try to, to, try to understand more about their patrons. So they'll subscribe to data services that will um, give, give them ideas of what magazines people are subscribing to, uh, we'll try to guess at what their political affiliations are and things like that. And the income uh, they estimate just based on where you live, right, then they can figure out what the, the census uh, average income is in that area. And so that's how we get that. Okay, and so I'm talking about the people in the top quartile of that. Cool. All right, other questions? Okay. So, yeah, yes. so, so, given that we're talking about a neighborhood supplier, mm -hmm. how much variation does that really get us? Because aren't all these folks basically from probably the same zip code, or do we have a lot of physical variation where they're located from which we can extrapolate their income? Oh, that's interesting because I don't see, I don't observe the, income, the zip code, but rather the information that, that comes from the zip code. So, that I don't know. I guess one way to look at that is to see how many people are, get the, you know, have the exact same thing. Right, you could you could back out how many different codes you you actually have. Right, no, no, they could, yeah, they absolutely could, but but that would it would answer the variation question to look at how, at least how many individuals. Other questions? Okay. So we looked at when benefit recipients are purchasing, and we find they're purchasing and eating greater quantities of food at the beginning of the month than at month's end, right? And it certainly doesn't seem to be due to some kind of taste for variety. We see you're eating the exact same thing, just kind of running short, right? And so the policy implication here is, is, is something that benefit recipients have actually asked for when they've been surveyed. Can we change the frequency of the delivery of the benefits, okay? And 10 years ago, we would have said, well, but that has some kind of cost. But now that they're electronic, not really. <laughs> Right? You, could split up, you could split up the benefits and give people half on the 1st and, and half on the 15th if they're having trouble making it stretch because having, having money available to you means a neighbor can ask you to borrow it or, or what have, to get around those types of issues. Right? Okay, um, so more support for that idea, which I, again, as I said, in interviews is something that benefit recipients have said that they, they want. All right, so now let's look at the pricing. 
Uh, and that's what I'm really excited about here. I see, but let me just finish my thought. Uh, this is what I'm really excited about here because, you know, as I said, previous work has looked at survey data and asked people to write down what they're, what they're eating every day. Uh, but what's been missing from this analysis is, is a look at the prices, right? Because you might think, well, people shop at the, at, at, we know everyone shops at the beginning of the month uh, amongst benefit recipients, and maybe the stores are really competing on those goods that the benefit recipients are, are buying, and so maybe, maybe, you know, it's all reinforcing. Yes? So I was just going to comment that um, based on the interviews that people seem they want the change in the frequency, right. that's, they're basically admitting we have difficulty doing time discounting, essentially, that we can't figure out how to budget our, our money over the course of the month that is one consistent story but I think the story that people more that people tell more frequently is it's it's hard to say no to people when you have access this is say no hard to say no to other people in need right and if you absolutely just didn't have money you, you wouldn't have to lend it to your so to people, people are actually buying things for their neighbors and helping out is that is that part of the story that's part of the story right Okay. Um, okay, so how do prices respond? And here we see again, using these same set of, of bars, the quantity change, which you keep seeing, <laughs> is, is on the left, and the price change is on the right. Okay, so the first thing to note is that the price doesn't change all that much. Okay, the price doesn't change all that much, but the second thing to note is that it does change, right? In the time that uh, benefit recipients are buying the most, the prices are the highest. It changes about 3%, where it was 30 something percent over here. Okay? Which is what people in, so the, the hypothesis you were laying out said the economist hypothesis, the computing for the customers, but right, right. anyone who lives in a poor neighborhood says, never posed that hypothesis. Oh, absolutely. So, so when I moved to, so when I move to, yeah, to move from all this beautiful data to my <laughs> anecdote, uh, which, is <laughs> which we often like to do, uh, when I first moved to New Haven, of course, I didn't know what day the food stamps came out. I guess I should have looked that up. So I got to the store one day, and it was packed, okay? Uh, and so it was packed, and I'm waiting in line all this time, and the woman in front of me turns to me, and she said, don't you just hate the way they raise the prices on the day the food stamps come out? So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If you lived in the neighborhood, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't think that. Yes? Are these prices the sticker price or the price that people pay? Uh, you mean with the discount card? Like, yes. Is this what you see registered in the data or is this the actual sticker price? Because if benefit recipients have cards less, at a less percentage than right, everyone. Everybody has a card here. Okay, this is still with. So the prices are Everybody has a card, so everyone has access to the discounts, both the benefit recipients and the non-benefit recipients. But that still goes back to the question. Is, are these the posted prices or the prices? These are the actual prices. Remember that we're, the data are coming from what is scanned. Okay. Right? And so, so if in the first week the same product is, is, has no discount, but in the second week it's 10% off, then that would register as a drop in price on this graph. These, every, right, I mean, there's not, there aren't different prices for benefit recipients and non benefit recipients. So you're aggregating up to everybody's all purchases during the month and looking at the prices. Like yes, let me answer that more specifically in, 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 in two graphs, okay? So remember that underlying this are, are three stores, okay? And I, let, let, let me just ask you to believe me that the behavior of the consumers at the three stores looks the same, okay? That this graph is a pretty fair representation of what benefit recipients are doing in store one, store two, and store three. But from the grocer's point of view, in store one, they make up a smaller fraction of the customers, and store three, they make up a much larger share of the customers. So let's look at what happens store by store. Now obviously I blew this up, so that you could see the differences. The differences are still small, but I blew them up so you could see them relative to one another. Right, so here's store one, 
Okay, and you have the change in price here. You, you do see the drop, right? One, one, one and a half percent there. Store two has more benefit recipients shopping there, right? They're doing a larger share of the purchases. And we can see that the difference in the price in week one and week four, lots of benefit recipients shopping, fewer benefit recipients shopping, okay, is, is greater on store two, okay, and still greater in store three. And in this graph, <coughs> what we've done is created a CPI, consumer price index, for those goods that benefit recipients buy. Okay, so this is for those goods that benefit recipients buy, what is the change in the price store by store? Yes? Is it a price drop as the month goes on, or is it a raising in prices at the beginning of the month? So it's a difference in price. I mean, it's how, how, how you want to say it, right? Okay. You want to say the price is higher at the beginning of the month, or do you want to say that the price is lower at the end of the month? Yeah, it just, so it just, I mean, week five only has two or three days, right? But, well, you know, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, the yeah, and then it's just, it's just back. I mean, it's all the weeks aggregated together, right? Yeah. I just want to maybe a related question is, um, I, I imagine that these are kind of artificially scaled, so like the week one price is considered 100% of the week one price in each week, or um, so it's maybe a different way to say this, They're, they're dropping the same percentage. Right. I imagine, like, they could be starting from a higher base. Or oh, absolutely. No, no. So it's, a, 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 yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, right, this is just talking about the differences. That's right. right. So I'm just curious about the levels. Is, are there stark differences not in the percentage change, but in kind of the in, in the initial not levels? Uh, not that I recall, but I, but I would have to look, look back at that to, to be sure. Other questions? Okay, and another way to think about this further, elaborating on, on your, your question uh, about what, which items are we talking about, right? So here we see uh, when benefit recipients are a larger share of your purchasing, we see a larger difference, right? Suggesting that, uh, when it, uh, that, the, that the store is actually uh, responding to uh, the behavior of the, of the shoppers. And we can see that another way by asking item by item, right? Remember when I showed you red bar, blue bar, red bar, blue bar, we saw that for different items there was a different change uh, in how much benefit recipients were buying at the beginning of the month and the end of the month, right? And we can graph that against the change in the price for each of those, right? So we can ask if, if there's a bigger drop off in how much is being bought, is there a bigger drop off in terms of the price? And sure enough, that's what you see here. So this change in price graphed against change in quantity, right? And uh, so what, what, you, what you should note here, obviously you can't read those individual points, is that if you were to graph a line through it, right, it would, be, it would have a positive slope, okay? All right. So how do prices re respond, right? In the typical way that one would predict as, as an economist, if we weren't trying to think of a loss leader type of, type of model, right? Prices for the goods that benefit recipients buy are higher at the beginning of the month when benefit recipients purchase larger quantities. Okay. The policy implication here is a little bit different than the one that the benefit recipients were asking for. If we, if we don't want the store to be able to respond, what we need to do is stagger the benefit delivery, right? What we need to do is say, 
family A, you get your benefits on the first, and family B, you get it on the second, and family C on the third. It could still be twice a month, but let's make sure that all throughout the month, benefits recipients are, are, benefit recipients are receiving their benefits. Now, that's not perfect. Obviously, the price could just settle at the highest point all throughout the month, right? And we don't have good evidence here because no state staggers a heck of a lot, right? There are, California goes across the first 10 days. The last digit of your social security number determines when you would get your uh, food stamp benefits. But nobody's really doing what I'm talking about, trying to really smooth things across the month. So I don't know for sure uh, what price point we would see things settle at uh, store by store. Yeah. Is all this driven by the benefits recipients or are there other constituencies that also get paid on the first of the month? I, mean, I just think that a lot of people would get paid. We don't find others cycling on the first of the month, but there could be other people in here who are cycling at other times. Right? Who have a different cycle. But, but I, I, a, a lot of monthly people get paid, you know, last day of the month. Right, but we didn't see anything for the non-benefit recipients in, in, okay. in, in this. So maybe that a lot of people in Nevada get paid on the 15th, and then we, you know, if, if we knew more context, we would see that. Um, okay. So right, so it suggests there's, there's a role for staggered benefit delivery. It'd be great if, if some state tried that out and we could see what would happen. Okay, so maybe some of the things I've said have been a little bit of a downer. I don't know. Uh, but let me end and say something positive about food stamps uh, and, and cash benefits, at least is related to the purchasing of food. Remember that big quantity change, there is a price change, but it's not huge, right? There is a price change, but it's not huge. And so what this suggests is the food stamp benefits are accruing to the food stamp recipients, seems to be, right? So, well, of course, food stamp benefits should accrue to food stamp recipients, but of course, that's not always the case. Let's take the case of the earned income tax credit, right? So this is our largest poverty program, and it, with the earned income tax credit, low-income workers who work, right, get back money uh, for every hour that they work, right? So, um, and the way the program generally works is nobody does the pay quarterly on this, although it is an option. Nobody does that, okay? Everybody waits until the end of the year, okay? Uh, gets their, their, their forms that they, they need to get and files for the EITC to get this money back. So people get a huge lump sum in February, March, okay? Not after April 15th, because people who are gonna get money back file right away, okay? So it's, it's more like February, March, uh, and people get a, a bunch of money back. Okay, so what happens in low-income neighborhoods when the earned income tax credit checks come out? Well, one, prices on cars and other appliances, flat screen TVs, are a lot higher when the tax refunds are issued, okay? Right, so I was talking about small changes, 36% change in quantity, 3% uh, change in, in price, but these studies here have found large changes, right? And so you can imagine uh, you're getting a thousand dollars back uh, and you were going to buy a flat screen TV for five hundred dollars, right? If that flat screen TV now costs a thousand dollars, right? What's as if five hundred dollars of this, of this uh, government program is being given to the guy who, who sells the flat screen TV, right? Yes. Is this coming from the same standard data? Or is this no, no, this is other people's research. This oh. is not my research. Yeah, thank you. They don't sell cars at the, they sell a lot of stuff. It's a big store, but yeah. Yeah, no, I know, I know. I was gonna say it is, it is a big store and I don't use all of their products, but that, this is not mine, so thank you for asking. Yeah. So you said in, in those neighborhoods, so is it only limited to certain neighborhoods that this happens, or is it across the board? The price increases on cars, for example, and other appliances? Uh, well, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure because it's not my research, and, and I imagine people were looking as only as far as they thought that people who receive these checks would be shopping, so I'm not sure, okay? I'd have to, uh, yeah. Uh, and what else happens? Well, uh, and this again is not my own paper, this is Jesse Rothstein here, uh, that we see that wages are lower for low-wage workers 
since its introduction, right? So you imagine that uh, you were making $8 an hour, the EITC is great, it's gonna give you an extra, uh, it's gonna give you an extra $2 an hour, right? So you're gonna then, in the end, be coming home with $10 an hour. Well, not if your wage is reduced to $6 an hour, right? Not if it's reduced, because your employer knows, well, you're gonna be getting some of the money for the government and you're still going to, to get just as much, right? And so this is, this is an example then of the benefit going to the employer rather, to the, rather than the employee, okay? So what's nice, uh, the, the policy, positive policy note then to end on is that unlike the EITC, with the food stamp benefits are, are accruing to the recipients, seem to be accruing to the recipients. Unlike evidence we found recently, uh, not me personally, uh, for other income support programs. Okay. All right, so now let's open it up to more questions. Yeah. Kind of a follow on to that, uh, to the question earlier. So um, typically when we're looking for these price changes, we're only being, the focus has been on the low income areas. And I think it would be even more powerful if you could show that there's absolutely no evidence of that in, in other areas. In high income uh, grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Because uh, all throughout your talk, I kept thinking, well, what's the benchmark here? So, you know, how much are these people eating of certain kinds of things relative to uh, more middle income neighborhoods? I, I, I'm sure the data collection would be horrendous. It's bad enough to do this, but it, it would be. We, we actually did, did, did do what you said. Oh, we, we have three stores okay. uh, in, uh, in a neighborhood that has very low, uh, in neighborhoods that have very low shares of benefit recipients, like one, two, three percent. Oh, okay. um, and so we don't see the price changes uh, there. Okay. Yeah, oh, no, that, yeah. That, that, that yeah, we, we actually did have those data. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're talking about the fruit and vegetable result in particular? Do you think that the, you think that the, buying, the, the buying pattern would hold on when you look at different regions and different ethnic groups? Yeah, so, so the question is, is asking, do I think the buying pattern would hold for different regions and ethnic groups? But what I'm trying to ask back is, are you talking about in terms of what they're buying or when they're buying? Uh, what they're buying. What they're buying. What they're buying. Yes, yeah, so I would think what, what I think when they're buying would stay. I think when they're buying, so uh, my thought is the same as yours, that what, what they're buying uh, would be, would, could be different um, from region to region. Uh, but when they're buying, I would suspect that that, that that doesn't change. Now, if we were working in the South, we would compare, because uh, the diet certainly is different in the, in the South, other than the Southwest, we would still want to compare the benefit recipients there to the non-benefit recipients there. And you might still see the benefit recipients in the South eating less health, healthily than the non-benefit recipients in the South, right? But we would, would want to control for the fact that Southerners That's eat a different diet. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I, um, I think the topic is really interesting. And I'm curious about your experience with the Food Stamp Program. Um, I know that you just asked for this data and they gave it to you. Um, I'm just curious. <laughs> so the, the, the question, I don't know if everyone could hear her, she's way in the back, is, uh, proprietary data. Did I just ask for it and, and get it? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, but you can apply for these data. So you can try, you can submit a proposal and, and see if they're, if they're willing to do it. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, whether the seller of their labor or mm -hmm. 
because they're, they're, they know their, their income, and therefore whether they're going to be at EIPC, and they cut their wages as a result. In the case of the, of the supermarket, you can't quite identify who gets benefits. Can you apply this to other programs and predict in which cases the beneficiary would capture most of the money versus uh, somebody else? Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, I thought you would have said Pell Grants and Colleges. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want to spin that example up for us? <laughs> this is interesting to think about. I, 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 let's do that thought experiment. Yeah. yeah. So and see if it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for housing, people with Section 8 vouchers are, are easily identifiable, right. right? So we would expect. So now let's look up if someone's done a paper on that. Yeah. That's, that's a great. We should just, I mean, when we're in your office, just write down. 10 and see what we guess it is and then go to the public finance literature and see if just that simple idea is enough to, to predict it. I wanted to um, ask a little bit more about this um, proposal to split the amounts perhaps the first and the 15th of the month. I guess it's not clear to me that if the households are saying it would make it easier for them to resist pressures to share mm -hmm. Might not work, right? Right, right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, right. So, so she's saying, well, wait. You see, if you have money twice a month, you're just going to be hit up twice a month for half as much. I mean, the asker can also change change uh, behavior. Uh, and, and I think that's right. But I think what they're thinking is, at the first of the month, say you pay your rent and um, maybe some other bills. Well, probably the main one main one is your rent and you buy a little bit of food and then you have a, a money left over like you know in some sense there's some sense of paying yourself first you are going to take care of your rent you are going to take care of food if you have something left over then that's what you'll share so the idea would be I have nothing left over and then on the 15th maybe I have moved my electric bill and some other things there and I buy some food and then you know I, I don't have anything uh, left to share but but you're right it might not it might not work other people can adjust their behavior, just as a store can adjust their behavior, your neighbors can adjust it even more quickly, right? They see what you're, t you're doing even faster, yeah. Um, I had a question about, so I mean, it was pretty stark, the quantity drop in the, in the supermarkets over the month. Um, in terms of, did you have information on just the number of customers that were accounted for? So I mean, is it the same number of people throughout the entire month, or are they also, are the stores also seeing a lot more people? Right, so some people shop at the beginning of the month and don't come, uh, some benefit recipients shop at the beginning of the month and don't come back, right? And so you would see, so you would observe a higher number of, of customers. But I want to be clear because of the concern that, well, maybe I do my big shopping at the beginning of the month and I go to other stores at the end of the month, that even if we talk about just the people who are there throughout the month, those people are buying less when they come at the end of the month. Okay. Okay. Were you at all surprised by the decrease in quantity as the month goes by? Because, I mean, I'm obviously not representative of the data you collected, but, you know, because I don't receive benefits and I'm only one person. But the way I see it is if I'm given a fixed number of dollars to spend per month, I'm not going to put all, you know, spend 90% or whatever it is in the beginning of the month and leave myself nothing for the end. God forbid I need something else. Right. Well, I wasn't surprised in the sense that. Um, people had shown this before with survey data that it would show up so starkly in the grocery store data was a little bit of a was okay I mean it was good that allows us to continue the, the rest of the project um, but I, I wasn't so shocked because I had heard this that, that this is in fact what people do and when I moved to New Haven I saw that the line was out of the door and the woman ex kindly explained to me I mean in her complaint but she taught me a lot right that that was not the day for me to uh, to go shopping. This idea that people should eventually learn to kind of make w this fixed amount of money last throughout the month, people have said, well, how come, you know, does that happen? So it, can you take these data and look at only people who have been on benefits for a year, right? So maybe it takes a while to, to understand exactly how far they're going to go. Uh, and you, <coughs> still, you still see that pattern. And also one more thing, sorry. So yeah. the lady who said to you, they increase prices so much in the beginning of the month. So why would this lady be smart enough to you know, buy only a little now and then buy more a week from now? 
no, no disrespect. In the way. No, I. I uh, Maybe you should prepare for a party. And she's <laughs> right. So, so that's that's really uh, what the. I mean, you've, you've got to the crux of what this literature is asking about. So, and we see this in the lot. Um, to ask why do we see this cycling? Right? So you're, you're asking some of the, the key questions. Well, why don't people eventually uh, learn to smooth? And then you know when we add our data that well actually the price is a little bit higher rather than helping resolve the puzzle, right? If we had seen that the prices were a little bit lower because they were doing some kind of if they were really competing on a good that was a staple in the benefit recipient's diet, they would say, oh well, you know. They're all shopping at the beginning of the month, but they're also getting quite competitive prices, so this explains it a little bit. But our evidence, as you point out, makes the puzzle even more puzzling to say, well, why don't people start to, to learn to change? I mean, is it uh, really liquidity constraints? Is it, uh, well, we need to spend more on food because the more we spend today than tomorrow when the neighbor comes to ask me for stuff, I don't have to, to give money, you know? It just makes the, the puzzle even more puzzling. Yes? I had a question about one of your um, policy implications. Um, you wanted to, for every uh, dollar worth of food stamps, $2 could be used at a, uh, like a fresh fruit. Program. Yeah, that's done, actually, it's in, done? So, in okay. some places. Now, where you did your research, was there? Um, no. A, there was or was not? There was not. There, there was not such a program, a double food stamp program. But there is one in Detroit, from what I in Detroit at the, but it's at the fruit and vegetable markets. What I was suggesting is now, if it's a neighborhood without a grocery store, what I'm saying is just <coughs> insulting. But if for neighborhoods that have a grocery store, do we see uh, if we introduce such a program, would we see people eating more nutritious food in in those neighborhoods? I was just saying. Let's at least try. We haven't seen the program tried in neighborhoods that already have grocery stores. Would the same type of program be a benefit in those types of neighborhoods? Posing the question. Yeah. I'm curious in the uh, areas where your research data is, is from, was that supermarket chain the only chain present? And I wonder, the reason I ask is, if there was more than one chain present, might they do something different with their pricing? Right. Yes. So she's asking what the competition was for the for the three stores. One of the stores did not have any. Okay. And one in one of the neighborhoods, there's actually another large grocer, right? And then another one, some uh, another grocer, but not not so large. So we, we run run the gamut. Yeah. That's yeah. Now I'm now I'm trying to remember. Of course, I I, I can't now that she's asked that that great question. So I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the, it's the food diaries from which we, we get that, that information, for, the, for which we believe that people are actually eating less. So there's a uh, paper by Jesse. Less of, um, of fewer calories. Fewer. They translate into calories, yeah, and show that, that people are eating fewer calories in a, in a paper by Jesse Shapiro. Let, let me put something. Just stop me when I get to the bars you're talking about. This? Ah, this is that. Those bars come from these bars, which were just every category in the store, which the the grocer determined the category. Are quantities. Quantity. 
the, unless I tell you their prices, their quantities, right? And so to compare different, so right, so cereal is easy, as you just said, we can just put everything into ounces, and we do something similar for the for the fruit. So you do it in ounces. Yeah, we do it in weights. Yep. No. Isn't it unrepresentative that produce, fresh produce, is quantified as produce, whereas frozen produce is split to fruits and vegetables? Is unrepresentative? You know what I mean is that instead of saying, you know, it shows what percentage or how they compare to this 29% line. Oh, well, I, I, I think what you're saying is wouldn't it be great if this, if we had, if we had broken out the fresh produce into fresh fruits and fresh vegetables so we could make a, a better comparison? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, the data didn't come packaged to us like that, but we could, we could do that. I mean, you could. I know what is a fruit and what is a vegetable, so right, I can go ahead oh, and encode it. <laughs> and code it. Yeah. So they, they gave you this data. Like this wasn't your decision. These categories, that's what I'm, yeah, yeah, right. this is response to this question here. The categories I'm using are their categories. Right. Yeah. I could, well, I can read the description, so please tell me. She's asking for, with, can I tell what's package, what's in a package and what's not in a package? We have decent descriptions of things, so um, what, what was your suggestion that we do with that information? I was just curious. Oh, you're just curious. Yeah, the, 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 the sorry. Um, the, the descriptions are, are pretty detailed about things, yeah. You know, if, if, you know sometimes a, a thing of oranges is already bundled into, Right, or then sometimes they were from the loose bin and you uh, picked them yourself. Yeah, we could probably tell that, yeah. Uh, as you presented uh, this material to other individuals, have you noticed sort of a preconceived notion on uh, people's perceptions on this issue already as the data sort of breaks through some of that? Well, you know, so mostly I presented to academics, but then there was a conference at the Federal Reserve where I got to, pre to present it to practitioners, people who, who, who work in this area quite a bit, and so they, they were not surprised. Uh, one thing that they said is they were surprised that people thought that we, the public, would think that something would be all that much different when we move to electronic benefits, right? So people thought, well, with electronic benefits, uh, you wouldn't be asked to help with others as much, you wouldn't be able to sell your food stamps as much, and you know that's kind of what the government said as they were introducing these things. And and the practitioner said, oh no, there's ways, there's still ways to to, to steal them, and there's still ways to uh, to use some for your neighbor, and there's still and people have figured out ways around all these kind of things. They're they're pretty much as liquid as the stamps. Don't be naive. Yeah. Uh, thinking more about the question, the previous question. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent the price response could be a result of people buying different things. I imagine, I'm thinking about lettuce, you can buy a head of lettuce, right. or you can buy a plastic tub that has it already torn up and you can basically make it as a salad right away. Okay. I'm sure you pay a lot more per ounce uh, that way, and, and at the beginning of the month when you're feeling flush, you might buy the stuff that costs more per ounce, uh, and then quit doing that at the end. Is it, would your that show up as a price so, so, in your data? So, so but um, uh, that would show up the stuff that you just, um, the fresh stuff that you were talking about that goes right into the salad, yeah. that would show up in the difference on the quality index, I think. That stuff is already, that, that would be something more like what a high-income high family would buy than something that what a low-income family would buy. So if we were seeing that kind of story, we would expect to see changes uh, in terms of quality over the month. But but it so that wouldn't show up as if the same family goes from high quality to low quality during the month, the price would also go down, presumably, because high quality costs more than low quality. Would the price could 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 your price drops through the month <coughs> reflect in part that people shifting to lower quality as the month goes? It could, but, but what I'm saying is it doesn't seem that people are actually shifting to lower quality. Oh, because, yeah, right. from that. Well, about as much as your price. No, no, I'm sorry. It's, it's actually wrong. smaller. Yeah, yeah, it's actually small. It's only about 1%. Yeah. And your price index is on 
fixed goods. I mean, you, your prices that you showed dropping over the course of the month are that a box. That's a fixed box of goods, right? That's that, a fixed that's box of goods. That, that, yeah. that costs three percent more at the start of the month than it does at the end of the month. Right. Uh, head of lettuce costs. Right. Right. No. But but yeah. I, I guess I, I I wasn't clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did the actually did the price index two different ways. One was looking at all the goods across the month, so then they would all be accounted for, <coughs> still be a fixed basket. But we've also done, let's just take the stuff that you buy in the first week and see what the price of that would be in the fourth week, right? And you get an even bigger decline, actually. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> yeah. Are there additional things that you are planning to do with these data and in this general area? Well, I think it would be interesting to, to do more on the nutrition front. Um, to understand more about the, the changes in, um, yeah, it, it, so the, the quantities are changing uh, throughout the month. How is the nutritional content changing? Probably not a whole lot because we see the quality uh, index is, is, does not seem to be changing uh, that much. So then, thinking about some of these interventions, what can we do to um, encourage people to eat healthier. So some of the things that I've, I've mentioned before, also, you know, well, the things that I mentioned, if we could find a state that was doing, there is one state that does staggering um, across, say, 20 some days. If it would be interesting to look at, at data for the, that state, if we could encourage uh, a locality to do staggering more greatly, uh, if we could encourage them, a locality to do, or someone else just to put up the money for uh, the double food stamps, right? Would that would that make any difference? Um, so maybe not with these exact data. I think now we need also some kind of intervention to see if if, if something changes. But one thing that you could look at, just using this exact data, is look in more detail about the nutritional content of the food, which I very crudely coded the quality here. But we could get into the different nutrients if we wanted to. Yeah. What time series do you have here? 26 months. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any families that go from having benefits to not having benefits, if they use the same loyalty card, it would be kind of interesting to see if they're buying different things when they are no longer eligible for benefits. Right. Well, we don't know eligibility, and remember right. our income yeah. is rough, but we do see them stop using, we, we yeah. could observe that they used them for three months and then they didn't use them for three months. So we could, we could, do, we could certainly do it that way. That would be kind of yeah. interesting. Uh, at least in Michigan, it seems, uh, having been behind people with um, cards, there are certain products, they're much more, um, like you can't buy small apple juices, you can only do large apple juices. Really? And certain size, there are mm -hmm. size limits to what can be used, the card can be used for. Right. Um, and I just wonder if, if people, you know, have more flexibility, obviously, once they're off benefits, whether or not they buy mm -hmm. the same things or not. Mm -hmm. Particularly so, on those goods that aren't constrained, right? right. Does, does the, right. Do the constraints then? Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Yeah. That's what I think that must be with yeah. constraints, yeah. not food stamps. Yeah. Um, if you could go back to this state and get data pre uh, February 09 or in April 09, food stamp benefits went up. Right. So our data are pre. You mean so now we could get if post. You yeah. Continue this or, right. Yeah. yeah I'd say straddle the, the right. You then see what an income shock does. Right. Right. And we could also see then uh, if more is captured by the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. How much do food stamps cost the government annually? Hmm. I don't know. Sheldon, do you know? Uh, this year, uh, forty million. And uh, I think in sometime in 2008. But it was closer to 20 million. Mm -hmm. So there's been an enormous increase. It's a huge program. It's a big program when it's not a recession, and it's a huge program during this recession. Do you know how much it costs ballpark, like per person, <coughs> for that annually? Uh, I think it's something like $100 a month a person, something like that. So 40 million people times $1,200. Billions and billions. It's, yeah. it's, uh... Okay, great, thank you. Please. Oh, we're 
want to take one more question and then, and then we'll wrap this up. I was just wondering um, how the quality index, how you got them, like how is quality <coughs> So it's the, a lot in the paper, but the two that I'm doing here, one is simply, is it a premium <coughs> good? So the store labels things as premium, you know, better cut of meat with less fat, they would label it as premium. So it either is or it isn't? For, so for that one, it either is or it isn't. We've got also, it is or it isn't generic is another way to, to, to do that kind of thing. We get something similar. And the second one is looking at those goods that the highest income quartile is purchasing. Please join me. We actually do have a reception right outside the double doors, and so if you'd like to stay for an informal discussion, please. Thank you. I see some.